Hello, Professor. Hi. Hi, Professor. How are you? Wait, wait, just a minute. Okay. Sounds good. Have to get this set up. Okay. Okay, take your time. Let me know when uh, you're ready. One minute. <clears throat> get some things organized here. <clears throat> Kids are crying on the background, so apologies. <laughs> I can hear you, doctor, if, um, if you have a problem with sound. Do you hear me? You can hear me? I can hear you quite well. Your voice is very lovely, by the way. Good. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Professor Chomsky, for this lovely um, opportunity. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Walid. I'm a PhD researcher in linguistics in Babylon University. So I would like to, first of all, thank you so much on behalf of Babylon University, my professors, uh, Hussein and Professor Farid and all other professors, they're saying hi to you. We have a big community of readers of your publications. So it's a great opportunity to say thank you on behalf of all Iraqi students who are reading your great works. Today, I think the best opportunity that I have is with you to motivate this generation. I have one question with some peripheral digressing uh, perspectives that I like to touch upon and uh, focus with you. And I will be lightweight, so I'm not gonna take long of your time, lovely morning where you enjoy your coffee uh, during this time. First, um, why should this generation learn English? That is the first question that I sent uh, to you through email uh, so we can discuss and hear your lovely insights about it. The floor is yours, Professor. Well, we, we live in a very tightly interconnected world uh -huh. that offers a great many benefits, but to open the door, you have to have the key. Yeah. The key is to be f fairly fluent in the what is at the moment the international, the general inter international language of uh, interchange, communication, uh, publication, and so on. Now it happens to be English. 20 years from now, it may be Chinese. Mm -hmm. Time in the future, it may be Arabic, as it once was centuries ago. The uh, at one time it was Latin. Uh, this is transitory. When I started teaching seventy years ago at MIT, the world's major scientific engineering university, I was teaching French and German to graduate students because if they wanted to have access to the scientific culture of the day, they had to know French and German. Now you have to know English. Yeah. But, uh, but I should say that one of the serious errors of my own life, just to add a personal con comment, had to do with Arabic. Uh, 75 years ago when I was a student, I did learn Arabic, mm -hmm. I learned enough to be able to read newspapers, a book, to converse with people. Unfortunately, over these many years, I let it lapse, which is a great gap in my understanding of the world and my ability to comprehend critical elements of the world, a yeah. mistake I shouldn't have made. And I don't think that others should make. Now, do you think now, um, I heard the last meeting that you had with uh, Professor Stephen Krashen, you touched base about the, um, the, um, the influence of, of internet on this generation, particularly. Um, you added a little comment there where, where you mentioned that the 
this generation particularly um, is distracted by internet. So, and then later on, you mentioned the importance of reading. Now, my question is, how do this generation approach reading? In what way that you recommend in order to um, enlighten their minds, uh, be more cognizant of the importance of language, especially English nowadays in this generation? Well, I don't know the situation where you are, but in the United States, it's been carefully studied the decline in reading is very serious. Yeah. It precedes the internet, but it's inten been intensified by the internet. This is a remarkable irony. The, uh, the internet gives you easy access to a vast range of materials. Of course. So to, for a researcher, it's a lot easier to be able to find uh, uh, archival material at your fingertip than to have to go to the research library at the university and read old microfilms. It's a big step forward. And to some extent, it's being used. You can read journals, commentary, discussion, meet people from many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's not being used. What's happened extensively is the internet has narrowed people's understanding and perception of the world. People tend, pretty naturally, I understand it, to turn immediately to things that reinforce their own beliefs, mm -hmm. that respond to their own particular interests and prejudices gets into a narrow world. I know in my, uh, there have been studies which show that reading materials in schools are now being lo lowered. The kind of books that used to be assigned in middle school mm -hmm. are now assigned in high schools. Uh, a uh, I can see it in my own teaching. I used to be able to use literary illusions uh -huh. freely and people understand them. Now they don't know what I'm talking about because they're not reading widely. They're glued to the internet on their own small bubbles. That has to be overcome if we're to have a world in which there's mutual interchange common understanding. I should add that the severe problems that humans now face have no borders. Mm -hmm. These are international problems, obviously true of the pandemic, even more dramatically true of global warming, of the threat of international conflict. Just about every major issue we face is one that is borderless, international. And we must move towards a world of mutual interchange, uh -huh. communication, solidarity, and a world of genuine internationalism, or else we're literally going to face extinction. Well, I can, I can confirm that this situation, particularly here in Iraq, is pretty much not better than the situation in the United States in terms of reading. I heard um, from one of the studies that they conducted recently that the average reader in Iraq reads about half a page per month, <laughs> which is like um, nothing compared to the amount of reading I used to read um, because I graduated with an MA degree in TESOL from California. I was taught there by Kathleen Bailey and uh, some of her fellow colleagues. I uh, want to move to the next point in our discussion, Professor, which is something re relevant to your comment from the last meeting that you had with Nabil and Stephen Krashen. Uh, in Iraq, we have a problem of lack of stimuli to learn the second language because the, you know, the context here is not supportive of learning second language. 
you mentioned quite insightfully the comment of uh, lack of stimuli of, in L2 or deficiency of stimuli in L2 context. So based on your uh, treasure of experience, how do you recommend we approach language teaching in Iraq? The only way I can think of is to stress to give students the opportunity to appreciate and enjoy yeah. the richness and excitement of the international cultures. As soon as you put your foot in, you immediately want to go to swim. It's an exciting, enriching experience. Just taste it and you're trapped and caught. You want to understand more. Mm -hmm. It's an exciting experience. I, speaking again of my own experiences, uh, much younger when I was so on, on, on average, where, uh, when you were a young person, on average, how many books did you read per, per month? If, if, you, if you can give me a comment on that. Well, I know from childhood, the most exciting experience was to be able to go to the library on Saturday uh -huh. and come home with a big stack of books, uh, depending on age started reading 19th century English and Russian novels then on to other things, but to be able to just curl up in a corner and to start reading the mass of books I'd accumulated that week was an exciting experience. And it still is piles of books everywhere that I'm <laughs> dying to find, find time to get to because it's so exciting to discover the amazing content that they have, the insights you learn, the perspectives, the appreciation of mm -hmm. what the world and human society has to offer. It's quite amazing that you mentioned culture because culture is really uh, relevant to understanding language. And out of the four skills, the major skills in language learning, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, which one do you recommend we emphasize the most in teaching L2 context here, spe specifically in Middle East, Professor? Well, right now, there's really no alternative to gaining substantial fluency in English. Mm -hmm. right now, it happens to be the international language. As I mentioned, 70 years ago, I was teaching French and German to graduate students at MIT because that's what you had to know if you wanted to do serious work in science and mathematics. Mm -hmm. Now, English, 20 or 30 years from now, maybe it'll be Chinese. But whatever it is, you have to be immersed in it if you want to be able to gain the yeah. enormous advantages offered to us by the integration of societies. That's, that's awesome. Now, the last question, uh, Professor, is out of all the collection of books that you have published, which one is the most endearing to your heart and you recommend us read and focus more on in terms of language here in Middle East, specifically in Iraq? You know, I'm often asked questions like that. <laughs> I can never answer. It's just too many dimensions, yeah. too many alternatives, too many options. Too much depends on a person's individual concerns, interests, and aspirations. So I think the right answer to that kind of question is search. Okay. Go to the library, go to the uh, bookstores, search. The way I gain my own education, I should say, is by having a desk in the great library of Harvard University mm -hmm. and just the ability to walk around the stacks and to get a sense of the richness and complexity of the cultures of the world and to be able to pick up a book on any topic you maybe you never even thought about and become immersed in it mm -hmm. is a tremendous way to gain a rich exciting education. 
Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I will definitely um, uh, send you another email in case you are available in California or Arizona, or I can come over and see, because I do some videos on uh, famous professors of language like Dan Larson Freeman, Stephen Krashen, and others. So you are the Ivy League professors. You are the pioneers of this field. And we look up to see you, meet you, hear you, and see your comments here. Specifically during this lockdown of COVID-19, people have been struggling, especially this new generation that is focusing more on internet and less on reading. Do you have, Professor, any final comments on words for this generation specifically um, to focus on as final words that you say to them to focus on this year, next year in terms of uh, language learning, uh, research, uh, focus on developing their skills? The only words that I have are to recognize the excitement mm -hmm. of being able, being in a position where you can have the riches, not only of today's world, but of the enormous contributions of the past, plunge into it, find out what excites you and engages your interest, pursue it. You have a great world ahead of you. It's open, it's available, but you have to take advantage of it. Professor, thank you so much for this lovely meeting. It's actually a great opportunity to hear your words, uh, especially when it comes to language learning and language acquisition. I often recommend my uh, students to follow you, hear your insightful comments on language philosophy, on politics, on all aspects that you talk about in your uh, meetings. It's a great opportunity. I think I'm the first Iraqi uh, person to interview uh, via Zoom. Is that correct? Could be. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. I wish you all the best in this lovely morning. I hope you enjoy your lovely coffee. I wish you are here where I can invite you to a Middle Eastern strong coffee. That will keep you awake. Uh, very pleased to have a chance to talk to you. Thank you so much, Professor. I wish you all the best and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye-bye.